It was Hollywood land. That was the construction of it, going up the mountain on Mount Lee in 1923. It was really to advertise a housing development. It had nothing to do with Hollywood and films and all of that. It was to advertise, because you know if you've driven by there, it's way up in the hills, you can't miss it. And it was to develop the housing, uh, housing development, Hollywood land. Each letter is 45 feet tall, 350 feet wide, which is quite big. Now, in the early 1940s, the Chamber of Commerce took it over. Uh, they own the trademark, and anything that you see from the early, from the 1940s on that shows that sign, they've gotten permission. They've had to get, anybody that's filmed has to get legal permission from the Chamber of Commerce that they can use that image. And that's when they decided, when they took it over, to just take off the last four letters and just you know, keep it as Hollywood. MGM, Louis B. Mayer, Marcus Lowe, and Samuel Goldwyn. All right, start with them. Marcus Lowe, who died very young, he didn't care about the movie making. He cared about the distribution. And he owned a lot of theaters. And the Lowe's name, you've still heard in hotels, and it's the same family. So he believed, his whole thing was, we've got to create beautiful theaters for people to come to. The movies don't matter. They're really just cans of, of celluloid. Well, not everybody agreed with that either. Sam Goldwyn, which is the, you know, Goldwyn, his name, he was an immigrant. His name was Shmuel Gelbfish. And when he came over, he changed it to Samuel Goldfish. Okay. And he was a partner, I mean, he was everybody's partner that nobody liked him enough to keep him. This guy went all over the place. His name was everywhere, he partnered with everybody, everybody hated him. There are a few people that everybody just hated, and Sam Goldwyn was one of them. The thing is that he was very, very, very short-lived in the MGM combine. They just used his name because he was there when they first started. Um, in, you know, in the mid-1920s. But if you know the Leo the Lion, which has been the MGM logo for over 100 years, that was Sam Goldwyn's contribution. Because he was in New York, and when he got into these par this partnership, he thought, I gotta contribute, I gotta do something very exciting. And his office was across the street from the library. And the, the, saw the lion, and he said, that's it. That's going to be exciting. We're going to bring that as our logo. So the librarian, Sam Goldwyn, uh, the first, if you look at the progression of the Leos, there's probably been about eight or nine by now, but that's because of Sam Goldwyn. But they, kept, they kicked him out very quickly, but they kept the name. So Metro Pictures, Sam Goldwyn, and you've heard of Louis B. Mayer, who really was the kingpin of the operation at MGM for decades. The interesting thing is that he never was a shareholder. He, didn't, he was basically a hired gun and an employee. And as much fame and, and prominence, and you know, for people that like old history about movies, everybody knows LB. And now he, he never owned any, any of the stock, which became an issue later on. He, ended up stealing Irving Thalberg from Carl Lemley. Irving Thalberg was at MGM for 12 years. He was such a master of reading scripts and pulling talent. And as far as the, uh, the stars, you know, there were the A-listers. It was the Joan Crawfords, Clark Gable, Norma Shearer. I mean, the, of the day, these were the top of the line people. And MGM had them. And, Irving Thalberg could read a script and he knew exactly whether it would be a hit or not. Uh, 412 years is a lot, of, a lot of, of star power that he was able to produce. Well, he ended up marrying Norma Shearer, who was the first lady of MGM. Here he is with, uh, with Norma Shearer. The, the, the irony of it is, is that she was so protective about his health and they went on this trip up to Northern California where it was damp and it was cold. If you've been to Northern California certain times of the year, it's, you know, you're, it's drafty and all that. Well, he got pneumonia. 
and he, and he died. He, he, didn't, he didn't make it. So he died um, 1937. And so he, I think he was, maybe he was, he passed his 37th birthday, but he was no older than that. So this was Metro Goldwyn Mayer. The Warner Brothers. Everybody knows the Warner Brothers. Okay, the top right. Jack Warner was the youngest of the four brothers. Up on the top left was Harry, who was the oldest, Albert on the bottom, Sam, and Jack. And there are so many different Warner Brothers logos. Um, they were from Youngstown, Ohio. Again, immigrants, that the family had been there. It's not, the last name wasn't Warner. You know, they changed it. The thing was that Harry and Albert stayed in New York, and Harry ran the administrative part of the company. And Albert, Albert Warner was the bean counter. He was the bookkeeper, he was the financial person. Sam Warner, Sam Warner was the inventive brother. And he took to the idea of why can't we get sound right on the movies. And I know all of you have seen Singing in the Rain, all right, where you see the brilliant Lena Lamont, you know, Jean Hagen, as Lena Lamont, and she's got the microphone, and she's turning this way, and the, the microphone's over here. It's a disaster, and of course, her voice was so awful, and that sound really did destroy the um, careers of so many. You remember the movie The Artist? He's doing great until he opens up his mouth at the end that he's got a French accent, and that was the end of him, and that just ruined people, just ruined people. So Sam Warner, Sam Warner, was the inventive one, and he decided he could find a way to put a record under the film. It had to be really synchronized, and he would play it, and he called the process, he called his company Vitaphone. Uh, if you look at old movies, and I hope you do if you're sitting in this room right now, if you see at the bottom of a Warner Brothers picture a Vitaphone company, that's exactly what it means. It means that it has that formula, especially in the early 1930s, that formula of running the, you know, of running the record under the, under the film, which of course had to be perfect because you know, the, the voices had to match up. The sad thing was, the sad thing was, and I'm, Charles, I'm going to hope this goes well, in 19, October of 1927, they were going to premiere the jazz singer, all right, the original jazz singer. And Al Jolson plays the singer, the jazz singer, who goes against his family's wishes, especially his father, that he doesn't become a cantor and all of that. So in The Jazz Singer, when they debuted it in October of 1927, Sam was all ready to go. Everybody was very excited. Right before, the night before, he had a, he was 40, 41, 42. He had a cerebral hemorrhage, and he died. He never lived to say it. 1927 clip, and the, look at the, how well healed these people are. It's so corny. <laughs> This was huge. 